You know, I got caught up in music just, just by being around and through him and then my mother, she played a little bit on the piano. And my whole family, you know, basically my whole family, everybody plays an instrument in my family. So, you know, naturally I got it natural. You know what I'm saying? Whether I wanted it or not. But it was just one of popping ever since I was a little youth, a little young lad. So I ain't had nothing to rely on with music. My father left me with music, my mother left me with music. So that was a good thing that they left me with music because guess what, music saved my life. Because even through like all throughout um, grammar school, when I got to high school or whatever, you know what I'm saying, it was just, by that time it was like, you know, I was the only dude in, in high school that had like, maybe like, for, on my schedule it was like four music classes. So everybody knew where to find me. Everybody, yo, you wanna find Joe? He and, uh, he in the music class where they be sitting on the piano. And, and back then I didn't even play piano. I only played a little bit, but my main instrument was drums. Oh, I love the drums or whatever. I mean, for me, it wasn't so much uh, like uh, musicians or nothing. I mean, I just was always attracted to music. You know what I'm saying? My household, my, my older brothers, like they, they listen to a lot of older music, like Peebo Bryson. And, uh, you know, that whole era, yes. Prince, all that type of stuff. And I was younger, but I had a lot of, you know, I got four older brothers. So my oldest brother, Willie, would bring, he was in the military, he would come home, bring all his music, and I just was infatuated with it. With it. And around that time, hip hop came out, let's, let's say about like 80. So once hip hop came, like, I was like, I liked the stuff about the older music, but I didn't like all the weird get ups and outfits and all that crazy yeah. stuff. You know what I mean? And when I saw hip hop, it was kind of like, uh, seemed more like, I could relate to that a little bit more in terms of how they looked and how they came across. I mean, for me, it was an outlet because I grew up in a, you know, housing projects where it was a lot of extracurricular that <laughs> you could get into that was kind of crazy. And I mean, just coming up, like I said, um, being attracted to the whole hip hop thing, the whole hip hop culture, you know, but then also you had people that was rapping and DJing, and they were getting attention. So I kind of followed that path, you know what I mean? And just kept a level head with that and pursued it and, you know, kept constantly just going on with that. And that was like my outlet. I mean, I, 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 I did it so much that all of the other things that I feel like, you know, other people might've went, wanted to play basketball or wanted to be nurses or lawyers or doctors. I was in school, I rapped through, like, literally through high school. Like, I battled, I was in the eighth grade rapping, battling people, went through the whole entire high school battle. Like, anybody went to school, like, I went to school with Akon, a lot of different people, and um, they know, they, they can tell you. I was, I had never go to class. I was in the hallways battling, I was in the auditorium battling, I was in the bathroom battle, I would not go to school. You know what I mean? But not to say don't go to school and do that, but that's just to show you like I was so entrenched and engulfed in that, like this was a thing. And I was like, I did it so long and so much, so for so long that at a point it was nothing else I could do but music. It had to be rapping, music, something from the music standpoint, because I had so much time put into it. It's deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we have. I have a cousin, which is a mutual friend. You know what I'm saying? Of ours, whatever. He's telling. He's telling me every day. Yo, you should link up with Chopper. And I'm hearing. I'm hearing about Chopper through everybody in the city. You get what I'm saying? So he coming to me every day. But little do I know, he was coming to him too. You know what I'm saying? Yo, my cousin. Yo, my cousin is the truth. You need him. Y'all need to get together. And at the time, like. We were both, we were both still doing music, but doing it with two separate, you know, situations. You know what I mean? So at yeah. the time we had, we, we kind of just formed a clique of producers, which is where we, you know, derived the name of the Dream Team with two other people. And basically we all just formed under, you know what I'm saying, one umbrella and started working together, you know what I mean, collectively. And um, that was kind of it, just like different producers from all over the city, we just kind of got together, four dudes got together, we all had the same common cause and common goal. Instead of everybody running around individually trying to do it, we just kind of envisioned like, dog, and everybody did something different. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was, at the time, he was 100% just R&B. I was more like traditional hip hop, boom, bap. We had another kid, Miller Time. He was more like radio kind of popish hip hop. And um, and then you had Sha. Sha was more like gritty, you know what I'm saying? More, you know what I'm saying? Like a RZA type, you know what I'm saying, producer. Right. So. 
putting all of those entities together and sounds together was like, yo, we could we we could take on any project. We could do anything. You know what I'm saying? You you wouldn't have to go to nobody else. You know what yeah. I mean? And that's kind of was the you know the the goal of what we set out to do. times early on we didn't really do too much stuff together because every like I said we all came from having knowledge of doing it ourselves like everybody had things that they specialize in better like uh, I was at that time nowhere near no type of R&B producer that was his thing he wasn't really I remember he 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 looked at us looked down on us because we did hip-hop beats like y'all yeah. do rap but you know what you know what you know what you know it wasn't even that it was me you know what everything real because I didn't know how to do rap like you know I looked at what they did especially what Chop did because it was like you know, he he understood different things. He, I remember him asking me. He was like, "Yo, well, you don't know the drummer from Cooling Gang. You don't know like." Yeah, like and I'm looking like, "Well, I don't." <laughs> you feel me? And Let's he, see. For me, it was like all of that. Yeah, for me, it was like like I said, I started out in it from a, a aspect of rapping, but yeah. I was kind of forced into having to produce the music for yeah. my when I was a rapper. So in the earlier days, everything was sample based. So I looked up. You know, other records that other people sampled. I look back into older James Brown, Cool and the Gang, Earth, Wind and Fire, all these people. And I should study the records because, you know, the musicians in those days sprung out and started their own bands and groups and started out, you know, and a lot of them was, was hotter than the main artists. Like, you know what I'm saying? You got from, I think out of James Brown band, you got Funkadelic, you got Boosie K, you got all those people that came out of that particular band. So a lot of those those musical influences was there. I was into all that. Like, yo, I'm looking at every record on the back. I'm looking at the covers. I'm looking at who did what, who played what instrument. And that's what kind of helped me evolve and from a production standpoint, from a music standpoint. From the time, let's say the time that we formed, um, the, the whole concept of the dream team and, and with the production and, and getting like an actual placement industry-wise, um, I say, ooh, time frame, it, it wasn't really that long. It was a struggle. It happened fast. Yeah, it kind of happened, happened fast, fast as far as us getting together. We all have our own personal long story struggles, but as a collective unit, I said we got together in 98. It was probably 99, the first break. You know what I mean? And um. I mean, we, we had put in, basically I felt like we had put in enough local groundwork as a unit to get the name up where everybody knew us and knew what we was doing and what we was trying to do, that um, we just branched out. You know what I'm saying? We, we reached out to some people in, in New York and from there things just kind of, you know, took a, a life of its own. They already in the room, so we walk in, you know what I'm saying? They stopped the session or whatever. We played them like what about three or four beats? It was about. It was. It was. I remember it like it was yesterday. We had a CD with 21 beats on it. Yeah. And when you know when you put the CD in the changer and the IDs, it says how many beats in it. The first thing they said was like, "Yo, y'all got 21 beats on the CD." Like it was. It was at a time period where they were more corporate. They wasn't really producing, producing no more. So they was like, "Man, we ain't had a beat CD with 21 beats." And. I don't know how long, yeah. you know what I mean? So that was the first thing, I always remember that. And then they played maybe, I say the first three or four beats and just stopped the CD like, yo. Yo, we want to, we want to, who is that? We want to do a deal. We want to do right something there. right there. I couldn't believe it, man. I was like, yo. Yeah, it was like, it was a situation like I felt like, that's what kind of just let us see that how the game really works. It wasn't about necessarily about uh, you know how necessarily how talented you are all the time, yeah. but the grind and who you know and who knows you because we we were trying to get to them like I say with maybe when we was messing with Don and I'm Don on it yeah. we were trying to get to them about maybe a month or so before that and the meetings kept getting canceled just based on a person that was trying to bring us through we meet up with these people they get us in a meeting instantaneously and get a response that fast so it was more so we had the talent but obviously the relationship that was there you know kind of mended that and made that happen the way that it did. The person that actually brought us to the situation, um, he had artists, you know what I mean? And that was kind of another thing that we did. He had an artist that everybody at the time in the industry wanted. His name was Ali Vegas. He was supposed to be the second coming to Nas and he was this and he was that. And there was a lot of hype and a lot of stuff going on around him and about him in the industry at the time. And by chance, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, he had him. So our idea and concept was, look, he had no demo. He was just going around labels rapping. 
He didn't have no songs, no nothing. So our concept was, look, we gonna do every song with this dude. We just gonna go and say, no money, no nothing, I don't care, we just gonna record anytime they want us to do it, just to do it because we, we had the understanding that when you go take this to all of these people, they gonna start asking, all right, he's dope, but who's these dudes doing these beats? So that was what we did. We sat there, we probably did like 13, 14 records with this dude. So everywhere he went and that they brought the music to, it was like, that was it. You really so, locked in with Chop a lot. Like they was at it every day. Uh, yeah, Almost not, every day. You know what I mean? Day. So it was like, okay, now we got this platform. So it was like, when we going, they going and playing his music. Like, who is these niggas doing the music? He dope, but who's doing the music? So it just kind of just drew them to us. So that's why when we finally actually met with Trap Master, it was like, oh, are these the same dudes that's doing? Okay, nah, we gotta do this. Let's just do, let's just knock everything out, sign him, give y'all a deal, give this. And and basically that was the first project they kind of put us on. You know what I mean? It was like, y'all do this. But we was already 13, 14 songs in. So, and they gave us, you know, uh, we, we became uh, executive producers on the project and we worked on it, worked on it for about a year. And then and the other thing with him was he was a kid at the time. And actually, from his situation, they de they derived the what they call now Macaulay Culkin law, where as a, before a parent used to could just sign for a child, you know what I mean, and sign a deal for him, and they give the consent. You can't do that no more after this situation during this particular situation. So it was like going back and forth to court, all that. So during that time, we you know we had to still work, and because we had that attention, that's how we started getting the putting us in with Fifty, putting us in with Nas, putting us in with all these different people because. We were there to work, you know what I mean? He gave us a song deal and a commitment, and while they was waiting to get all this situation done, they just, you know, basically did that. Gave us money, built the studio, gave us money in advance for us. It was a real, real decent situation. You know what I mean? First time, I'll never forget the first time we met 50, though. First time we met 50, yo, this dude, yo. <laughs> yo I was like, yo. This dude is crazy. <laughs> Yo, he was on the phone, so we walking down. It's about nine of us. We walking down the hallway, and I can remember him being on the phone. Mm -hmm. On the whole, remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the dude was on the phone. So next thing you know, he hangs the phone up and just start walking towards us. So, we like, so I'm looking. I'm like, all right, maybe he's just saying what's up, whatever. Yo, he, he walked up to all of us first of all, <laughs> head on, held up his <laughs> shirt, and was like, "Yo, y'all friend of foe." So we looking like. <laughs> Is this a setup? <laughs> like, yo, nah, we cool. You know what I'm saying? We just here to see Tony Pope or whatever the case be. Yeah. Yo, he literally held up his shirt and had the gun right there. Yeah, yeah. Straight up on us in the hallway. This is before him getting shot. This is like when I like I hear stories about niggas, oh, he didn't see that. Yo, he's been the same way. Yo, he been the same way. I like, I was tapping Chop all that night. We was in the studio with him. I was like, Chop. He crazy. He crazy. <laughs> I was like, Chop. He been the same way. Straight up. Niggas put off nine. And they kept coming in like, yo, this record hot, what's up with the sun? He ain't show up. So they go in and 50 lays a hook. And the song is, um, Project is Too Hot. He lays the hook. Niggas is like, oh, that shit is crazy. Nature come in, like, yo, let me get on that. He get on the hook, he does it. And then, and they, they jump in, they do their parts or whatever. And um, now the record is done. They send the record to Nas. And now he wants to come, oh, I want to do it. Now, because they just, you know I mean, they killed him. A lot of people don't know, at the time, 50 was running with Nas and them. Like, he used to live with him and everything, in, in his house in Long Island. Like, when they was doing the whole QB thing, all that, 50 was 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 a part of their situation. So later on, they went and wound up having beef, but in the earlier stages, he was a part of what, what he was doing. This was like 99, 2000, and he was a part of that movement or whatever, and um, so they was always around the studios and different stuff. That record came out of that, and that's how we forged those relationships, because we was always around these people, you know what I'm saying, on a constant basis. Okay, now the other thing about that record, when he finally does lay his verse, he lays his verse on that record we was talking about, the Too Hot, and he disses our artist, Ali Vegas. Yeah, so he says a line in it dissing Ali, because when, like I told you earlier, Ali, they were trying to make him the next Nas. This is Nas on the ass end, before the Jay-Z battle, before that. So Nas was kind of dying down. So they felt like they had a new version of Nas with him. And somewhere along the lines, it became, you know, Nas took it personal, he had an issue. So I just felt it was, it was weird for you to jump on a, I know why he did it, because Ali did a record with one of his producers, and some kind of, you know, you can kind of feel like he took a shot at Nas. So Nas gets on a record with a record we produced from and took a shot back at him. 
So that was it. Then it was like, okay, we're gonna put this record out, we're gonna go with it. We like, all right, cool. He falls out with nature and the record never hits the light of day. Instead of just taking nature off and putting it out with him and 50, he just never did it. So 50 and them took the record and ran with it and stopped. That's how it even got out. You know what I'm saying? He took the record and put it out. Shout out to him and shout out money. They took it and put it out and got us some light off of that. And, and that was it. It was a K Slay record for. Too much for me. Yeah, with his album was A Marie. Originally, it was A Marie, Baby, and Loom. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I get a call. They said, oh, they're going to put Nas on the record. So we like, oh, that's dope. Yeah. Get a call from the engineer. He's like, yo, we at the studio. One problem. What? Nas doesn't want Loon on the record. Yo, we like, oh my God. Mind you, this is not even Nas' song. This is K Slate's song. It's not Nas, he's just an artist on the song. Ah, he don't want, he doesn't want him on the record. Okay, cool, that's dope, whatever you say. So the engineer's like, well somebody gotta get here, there's nobody here, there's no producers, and, um, K Slate not here, so I go over there, get there, and dude is really adamant, like he does not want this dude on his record. We like, why? And it's the funniest shit hearing this, this uh, engineer, remember Glenn? Glenn. White dude, he's like, yo, yeah. He says Loon is a gangster. So he, he doesn't want him on the song. So we bugging like, yo, he can't be serious and be like this. Nah. So I just, just to make everything smooth before anybody and get all out of hand, I'm just like, his real goal was that he had an artist that he wanted to put on the song. So he needed to remove Loon to put him on it. So that's all it was about. He let, I said, let him record him on it, put him on the song. Then when they left, Slay come, we gonna take him off anyway. So they put him on, boom, get there, Slay comes, he flipping, what? This is my record, who is this dude? Yeah, da, da. Everybody losing it. So it was like, Everybody. because Slay and Loon had a relationship, they from the same area, they from Harlem, they from the same, like damn near the same block. So it was like, yo, he, you know, he felt, you know, like he didn't want to take them off. True. But K Slay was on Sony Columbia at the time, Nas was, and the label felt like, we need Nas more than we need Loon on this record. So based on instructions from the label, they took them off, you know what I mean? So now, it's missing a slot. Who he used to fill his slot? So they said, I think they said Luda at first, but Luda and Nas had just did they shooting remix, so niggas was like, nah. So at the time, our manager at the time said he'd get Foxy on it. So they put Foxy Brown on the record. They tell Nas, this is a single. They shooting a video, they know everything before this even happened. Baby, they call that, that, Nas. Baby was on that back then. Baby was on it, yeah, you know, I said baby. Yeah. Calls Nas and tells Nas, Foxy Brown's gonna be on it, because you know they had their tension. Foxy Brown's gonna be in this record. He like, cool, no problem. Two weeks before it's time to shoot the video, what Nas said? He ain't doing the video. <laughs> Why? Yo, because Foxy on the record. <laughs> yo, I'm like, yo, come on, man, it's only something. Yo. So this is a single, this is our, one of a good look for us. We got A. Marie, Baby yes. on the record at the time. They shooting yeah. the video, it's, it's popping. We like, yo, you we in. Like, yo, this is it, baby. Yeah, we, we, we about to get another dope. one, we yes. about to jump off. We work out some 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 things about doing dealing with the record, and Puff sits on it. They record it, but he sits on it. But he actually wanted two beats from us. Yeah. So the other beat, and mind you, paid us for him. Paid us an upfront fee upfront. for the money. Boom. So now, the other record that we do with him, Nas writes the lyrics for. So when he's in the studio writing lyrics for this song, he hears that I know I've been changed beat. So on the low, he goes behind nigga back to the nigga and, went and says, oh, I want that, that beat. After, I mean, time went by, but Nas is like, yo, remember that other beat that y'all did that niggas had for that? I want that. What Puff doing with that? So we like, we don't know. So he's like, look, we'll give you X amount of dollars for it and pay Puff back if y'all get the beat back from him. Now this Puff, how you gonna tell, Puff? even if he using it, ain't using it. Yeah. How you say, yo, you remember that beat? Give me that back, your homeboy, give me that back and let me get this this boy. So he didn't want it, but the thing was, Nas wanted it for a record with him and Jay-Z. This is the first Nas Jay-Z record ever gonna exist. Yes. So what you, and, and. Oh, yes. so you know, we like, son, let go. Let that's going. Puff gotta get the hell out of here, that's going. <laughs> Real like, talk. Why you Puff wanted his money back though? What? He ain't care. That he wasn't trying to hear that. that so niggas was like, all right, cool. So the niggas, Nas and them, they reach out. 
And I remember there was like some secret agent shit because I think this is before Nas even came out at the garden with Jay-Z. So nobody even knew that they was working on this deal, no nothing. We knew because of, you know, what was going on with yeah, them buying this music. Right. And you know I was hurt. <laughs> Chap called me. You know? <laughs> Hold on, we, 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 we gonna, we gonna get to that. Okay. So, boom. The Nas niggas like, yeah, you want the record, boom. They cut us a check. They tell us, oh, you gotta bring the C. You couldn't even email the beat to the label. You gotta go bring the CD to Jay-Z's office. So we go take the CD to Jay-Z's office. Bong. Okay, about two weeks in. Okay, what's going on with this record? What's going on? We popping. Niggas offering us publishing deals, all types there of shit behind this one record. And I'm in. Swear to God, we ain't never heard the record. It's recorded, but we've never heard it to this day. They Boom. did the record. Him did it everything. It's called I Know I've Been Changed. So we like, oh, damn. Boom. Then one day. No, wait, no, I was sitting in the pizza park. You was like, you called me. I never forget, I was in Bayonne. You said, yo, it's a go. I was oh, in yeah. the pizza park. I ordered like three more slices. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. It's a party, baby. You want a slice? You want a slice? <laughs> it's going down. Yeah, because when we offer this, I'm like, like I said, they offered us a pub deal, everything. So yes. we like, we good. Money. We're in the money. I so about, I said about. I said about two months in, it's right before the holidays of Christmas time. I remember the years 05, right before 06 coming in. And uh, uh no, it's 06, yeah. getting ready to come in to 07. So I tell him, um, check this out, uh, uh, what's going on? So I get a call from an engineer, and he's like, yo, did y'all, are y'all on a Nas album? Like, I'm working on this Nas album, I didn't hear none of the music that y'all, I heard y'all was doing something. I said, yeah, we got the record with Nas and Jay-Z. So he's like, you sure? Like, yeah, nigga, they recorded it. I got the, I got the paperwork, everything for it. Yeah, all right, check this out. L.E.S. did the beat for Jay-Z and Nas record. I'm like, are you, so I'm thinking maybe they trying to jack us for the credit. So call back over, speak to my manager. He calls over there, he finds out. Nas is in the studio recording, uh, what's the name of the song? Black Republican, I think. Mm -hmm. They're in the studio, he's recording his verse. Jay-Z walks in and hears it. Oh, I gotta get on this. Goes in the booth, lays his verse. No, they do that song. Was high. Hey, I mean, I mean, I don't know what they said on it, but I know our beat was hotter. But definitely, no disrespect, that yes, that's my man. But you fuck up my check. He was trying to do a song with him and Will Smith called After School, and he uh, he went in the studio. We did the. It was called something else at first. I think Jawan song on the hook. It was something else originally. He did it, yeah. and that was the thing. He was kind of open to, like, you know, he's LL Cool J, open to multi platinum selling artist, and he cared about our opinion. We hadn't had no hits, no nothing at this time. We just had good music. But we went in the studio, and it was like he let us do us. He asked for our opinion. He asked for our direction. It wasn't like I'm gonna go do this and y'all sit y'all asses here. You know what I mean? It was never that. It was always just mad. It was cool. Like you know what I'm saying? A crazy story was we got to the studio. Was we did it at, we wound up, it didn't happen with, with Will Smith, it wound up being Puffy. So what wound up happening was he, he we got to the studio one day um, before all of them, and he called up and was like, yo, y'all there? We like, yeah. He's like, okay, um, well, I, I need to let y'all know something first. So we like, what? Yo, when, when, when Puff get there, when your man Puff get there, don't let your butt get all moist. <sighs> I'm like, yo, what the fuck is you talking about? Like, what does that mean? First of all, like, you know, basically like, yo, don't get up there and be on this nigga dick when he come, cause this our shit. And, and that was the whole thing, he embraced us. It wasn't an LL Cool J, it was, we the dream team, you LL, it was ours. All of this shit we doing is ours. Don't let this nigga come in there, touch no buttons. Don't let this nigga tell you what to do, no nothing. And the thing of it, so I'm already thinking he gonna come in with that shit. Yeah. But another dude, he came in came at in. the level he yo, at, had up, the yo, utmost respect, never man. did nothing crazy, oh, never yo. said nothing Before crazy. Before he ever touched the button, he, yo, the funny thing, we in his studio. Everything like about it was his, fuck all that, nigga. This, nigga. It's pop, come on, man. You about, come on, man. Yo, the dude, before he ever touched anything in the studio, he asked us first. And I'm looking at him like he crazy. Like, exactly, he like, you crazy. and the nigga turned to me and was like, what you think of, I'm looking at this nigga like, nigga, what you think? Yeah, yeah, what you mean what I think? Nigga, you puff. It ain't what I think is what you think. What you seeing didn't start with LL today. Take it from me, run DMC paved the way with Jam Master J, the K-I-N-G's. Run D and Dr. Pepper, that's originality. LL needs a beat for this, uh, he's doing a Dr. Pepper commercial as a tribute to Run DMC. Yes. We need a beat. I mean, literally, we went in there. No sooner than our manager left, by the time he was on the highway to go to New York, we called him back, like, we got it. 
Come back and get it. He was like, what? <laughs> come back. It was the era before emailing. So he had to get back on the highway, come back, physically get the CD, play it for LL. They was like, that's it. We went to the studio and it's ironic. The week we went, um, this is the first time I ever saw a CDJ like turntables, like somebody DJ and it was Jam Master J. And that's the week before he died, before he got killed. We went to, uh, I think it was Right Track or Soundtrack yeah. Studio somewhere and we laid everything and did it and mixed it there. We, I think I, I'm, we, we might have just, we missed uh, Run DMC, but I think we caught Jam Master J on a, cause he was still doing scratches or something. So we went there, finished it out, had a ball. It was, it was dope and the song yeah. came out. And there was another thing, okay. what y'all want? A word, okay, $20,000 check. It was like no nothing. Problem. It was no issues because the person of his caliber is like, though, you making money. These dudes are worth what they, what they asking for, pay them. You know what I mean? That's the much love. Yes, yeah, always. So, I mean, to to this Jamie. day, and that's the that's only that's the only plaque we got. Straight I mean, we got plaques from other things, and we yeah. didn't get them. But that's the only plaque, plaque. physical plaque. Yes. And I hold dearly with that plaque because I, I I felt everything that went into that whole project of getting it and getting out there and everything. There's more with that relationship. It was a little more genuine. A lot of times you have relationships in a business where it's 100 business, and niggas even then they still don't do fair business with you. It True. was it was good. Nas publishing situation, Jay-Z record. That was the breaking point for me. And I was like, I was trying to explain to Joe at that time, like we were, first of all, like I said, we started out with four of us. We had already went through a transition where it broke down to just me and Joe. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So once we got to that point, we were still grinding, doing whatever, but I just got frustrated with the whole way the game was being. It was just, it was more of the game than business. You know what I'm saying? Just broken promises, people telling you this, people lying all the time. I just was like, I was kind of through with it. So, huh? Oh yeah, we, yeah, 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 exactly. So, so I was kind of through with it, and we were still doing it, but I, my my focus wasn't completely there because of what we went through. So I was like, I was doing other things, trying to make money, real estate, houses, different other stuff. So my mom wasn't there, and I was like, if I do do it, I got to do it from somewhere else. I can't be in this, and and it was just getting congested, the whole New York scene, the whole everything. So I was telling him, like, yo, I'm about to, I'm going to Lynn. And I think they thought I was bugging. I was I like, yo, you, I do, I'm I do, out. I sure thought he was bugging. The nigga been, what? grew up in the city all his life, 30 something years, you moving to Atlanta and do what? You know what I'm saying? So that was kind of my idea, like, yo, I'm out. I'm going to Atlanta. And I really wasn't even pursuing the music when I left to go to Atlanta. Nah. It was just like, I'm out. And so whatever happened, happened. For, he stopped with the music for a minute after that. And I was like, yo, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what's up, yo? Next thing you know, and it was like, yeah, we moved to Atlanta and like Atlanta, it, it just switched. What, what was used to be in New York was now in Atlanta. So I moved right into it all over and you still got the hit, so you're gonna do it. So it was like, always still had equipment, still had, so we just kind of yeah. just got back to working and, and grinded from there. And just, it was just like starting over though. 